question, and finally, I'll open the floor for questions from the audience. So the first speaker I'll be introducing should be on the screen, <laughs> because he's joining us from online. Um, it's Dr. Reinhard Scholl. Dr. Scholl is the co-founder and managing director of AI for Good, the United Nations platform on AI. For the past 22 years, he has been a senior executive at the International Telecommunication Union and the United Nations Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. Previously, he worked with Siemens in Germany and the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, and he received his PhD in physics from the University of Illinois. Would you like to give a small opening remark? Here, I didn't have a sound uh, in here, the, uh, the initial the introductory remarks that you said. So I just make some, some general remarks about uh, AI and, uh, and ethics and regulation and governance. Yes, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, uh, I'm super enthusiastic about AI. I'm also concerned, like many people, and then I would like to give you how I see the, uh, the current landscape for, for governance. So I'm a heavy user, a pretty heavy user of uh, tools like ChatGPT. But I think the uh, most impressive use, besides the uh, ChatGPT like large language models, has been in the sciences. And for people who are not involved, maybe that much into the sciences, uh, let me explain you a bit why scientists or why I'm so, so excited about it. There has been huge progress, or maybe the most impressive application uh, that has been done uh, was done by uh, Google's Steve Mind on the deciphering of the uh, three-dimensional protein uh, structures called AlphaFold. And uh, people have been have known for uh, for decades that. Uh, the uh, proteins are built by amino acids. There is a linear structure, a linear sequence, and it folds uniquely into a 3D structure. But so far, it takes about one PhD thesis to figure out the 3D structure of a protein. But what AlphaFold was able, what DeepMind was able to do with uh, AlphaFold was they predicted pretty well, you know, perfect, but really, really well, the structure of all human proteins, so it's about 20,000, but not only of all human proteins, but like all the known proteins of animals, of plants, of fungi, so over 200 million. So this is just unbelievable, you know, the progress has been made through uh, 3D Mind Alpha Fold. So I think whenever I talk about it, I say, you know, this is worth, this is worth Nobel Prizes, at least one Nobel Prize. So this, this thing is very impressive, but what's even equally impressive is they made all these structures available for free to the world. And tens of thousands of scientists are using that you know, to, to try and figure out new, new drugs or you know, things like that. So this is just unbelievable progress that has been made uh, with AI and the scientists. And the sciences. I mean, there are other areas like you know, superconductivity. In physics, there is something called superconductivity. You can transport electricity uh, without uh, loss of uh, uh, energy uh, due to heat. But the problem with these superconductors is you have to pull them to really low temperatures. And the holy grail is uh, room temperature superconductors. And uh, I think uh, you know, AI could be an excellent tool figuring out uh, discovering uh, IATC superconductors. Uh, another example is uh, weather forecasts. So the, the way you currently run weather forecasts is you run your physical models on large supercomputers. And that takes, you know, that takes some time. It takes a couple of hours, and then you get the you get the weather forecast. But just a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, again, it uh, it was uh, Google. They came up with um, a machine learning model that was able to predict the weather, maybe to a first approximation, perhaps even better than uh, the weather forecast that was done by the uh, models that are based on, on physical models. So there's just amazing uh, potential for AI and sciences. Now, to the second point, why you know, people are concerned, and uh, I include myself uh, here as well, uh, are all you know, the problems uh, that we haven't really figured out yet, problems with uh, respect to disinformation. Uh, the AI will have a big impact on, on employment. 
I think one book that I would uh, recommend you to look at is a book by uh, two economists from MIT called Darren Atsimoglu and uh, Simon Johnson. It came out April last year called uh, Power, Power and Progress. So they have looked at how technology over the last thousand years actually diffused into the uh, uh, you know, uh, wider masses. And uh, it, they showed with, uh, with lots of examples that you really have to work hard, hard to make sure that the technology, that the gains of technology are not just limited to those in power and uh, to the elites. Um, and if you look at agriculture in between 1000 and 1300, there was lots of uh, technical innovation with water mills, wind mills, fertilizers, but all the gains went to, the, uh, to those in power and the life of the peasants uh, actually got, got worse. So uh, one really has to look carefully and make a huge effort to make sure that the gains of AI are not just limited to uh, a small group of elite. Now the the problem is, you know, people always often say, you know, it depends on us. We have to decide uh, where, uh, how to how to regulate, how to govern uh, AI. But uh, who, who is we? Yeah, is it is it you? Is it is it me? Is it uh, is it Open AI? Is it uh, a new startup uh, that's uh, on the horizon, or maybe even not yet on the horizon? So uh, <clears throat> I hope that. It's not just money that's going to rule where I will be going, but that the uh, uh, that the regulators and the, and the governments, together with you know the industry, find ways to make sure that it's going in the right direction. I like, in particular, the position of uh, Demis Hassabis. You know, he's the the founder of uh, of DeepMind, and he's now the, the chief of the AI business of Google. Uh, he says, you know, uh, break things and uh, be fast and break things. This is not a good way to uh, to move forward with AI. He prefers very much the scientific method. You know that you, uh, you do experiments, you run, you test your hypothesis, and that you move carefully. So I think this the same should be done with respect to AI. Great. Thank you so much for your introductory you statement. <laughs> The second speaker I'd like to introduce is Clemens Mante. Mr. Mante is the spokesperson for the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs of Austria and the head of the Press and Information Department. He has served in the Austrian Diplomatic Service for over 30 years and was the director of the Austrian Office of Science and Technology in Washington, DC. He's a trained lawyer who studied in Innsbruck and the University of Trieste. Welcome. But I'm here today as a private person or as a former lecturer here at the Diplomatic Academy for a course on tech and smart diplomacy. So that's a disclaimer because I'm not here in my official position and I have to tell you that uh, before. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm really feeling because of that a little bit the odd man out. I'm not the expert here on, on this panel. Uh, but I'm in the discussions about regulation uh, of AI quite a long time when I was back in, in uh, the United States when the discussion started six or seven years ago. Uh, about whether to regulate or if we should have just ethical guidelines for uh, the corporates. And the problem for me is now six years on or seven years on, uh, I frankly have to admit the discussion didn't move on. And I promised to myself I would never attend a meeting on AI or a discussion like that anymore. So here I find my, myself again uh, on the other side. So I tried to maybe go a little bit against the stream as a lawyer, just want to tell uh, what's happening with the AI Act, right? Is just the normal procedure in the innovation cycle, I would say. Whenever an innovation or an idea goes uh, or spreads in a potential exponential way, uh, always regulation kicked in in history. This was with cars and any other invention that we had so far. As a lawyer, I'm strictly always for regulation because ethics is the basis of regulation, uh, but there should it should not be a substitute. And even as we know, regulations and rules usually also enforce ethics. When we're talking about AI, uh, the discussion is very similar to genome and genetics and the discussions we have in, in this field as well. So I think it's nothing particular. And uh, well, discussion will move on. Uh, and I'll stop here. And I hope also in our discussion here. 
The third speaker I'll be introducing is Eva Gumnishka. Ms. Gumnishka is the founder and CEO of Humans in the Loop, a social enterprise which supplies diverse and high quality human input for AI systems. Her company has provided remote digital jobs and training for refugees and conflict affected people. She holds a degree in human rights from Columbia University. Welcome. Great, thank you so much for having me. Um, so my position is as someone who comes from the industry and someone who has been working with AI companies for the past six years, working on their data sets, making, trying to make sure that they're working with diverse representative data that is annotated in an ethical way. Uh, through my company, Humans in the Loop, uh, we provide employment to people who are affected by conflict. And this is our way to kind of introduce them to the world of AI and to use this niche, which is called data labeling, in order to generate uh, new training and employment opportunities in some of the regions that are worst affected by armed conflict and uh, that have the least access to remote work. Um, in our company, uh, almost since the beginning, we realized that it's really important to have an ethical and responsible AI approach. Uh, we designed our internal ethical AI policy, which includes uh, our rules around how do we prepare data sets for AI companies, uh, how do we collect data sets to make sure that they are uh, bias-free as much as possible. Um, we have our uh, proprietary trainings for our annotators so that they are aware of their important role in this uh, pipeline. Um, we design human in the loop uh, pipelines for human oversight, which is also another aspect that is covered in the AI Act and is really important, especially for high-risk uh, AI systems. And we also have rules uh, for our management team and trainings that include, for example, what AI applications we refuse to work on. And these include, for example, working with sensitive content uh, for content moderation, you know, because this is not content that we wish to expose our workers to, but also uh, some problematic uses of AI, and particularly uh, military AI. Uh, this is a topic that I've been increasingly working on uh, recently, especially in light of the war in uh, occupied Palestine. And I've come to realize that, you know, we're doing a lot of work to try to regulate applications of AI, such as CV screening applications, um, medical devices, and so on, and that's all great, but nobody is regulating uh, AI for military purposes. And this is one of the most harmful and dangerous uh, applications of AI. Um, and, you know, people talk about existential risk and AI wiping out humanity, you know, all of that hype that uh, started to grow recently with ChatGPT. Uh, in fact, a lot of companies and governments are investing a lot in building solutions uh, that are increasingly augmenting our capabilities to destroy and to kill, um, and nobody is regulating that. It, it's conspicuously excluded from the European AI Act. It's something that uh, nobody is mentioning in any other types of AI regulation, uh, with the argument that this is a matter of uh, sensitive national security, uh, but I would say it's one of the areas of AI that we need to be most concerned about. Um, and as I see it, we're currently over-regulating CV screening uh, apps and under-regulating uh, military AI. Great, thank you. The fourth speaker I'll be introducing is Julia Spantik. Mr. Spantik is a senior consultant at EY and has extensive experience in the field of technology risks and conducting information security audits of critical infrastructure operators and operating systems. And he holds a BSc and MSc in business administration from Bayreuth University. Welcome. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, as you might have noticed, I'm a little bit uh, from a different field as an uh, auditor and consultant in cybersecurity, but that works, work also incorporates uh, analyzing new regulations which might have an impact on the clients. And um, yeah, my first contact with AI or machine learning in general and um, predictive models was when I uh, was uh, doing my studies when I was uh, researching in the field of uh, data science and data analytics. And what I learned there that is that AI is always in some kind of way biased. And um, we can't, we can like um, eradicate the bias that is harmful, but we can't eradicate all the biases. For example, if you think of an application which is made to make a decision um, who is going to be promoted 
and you feed that with historical data, with past, um, past um, promotion data, it will always choose or prefer a white male because that's how it was in the past, right? And the goal is here to, to find these biases and um, to um, actually get away from that illusion that a machine is um, deciding more um, objectively or rationally. And, and I think the AI Act is a, is a good step in the first direction, even though I think it has a lot of exceptions, for example, the military and um, got diluted um, during um, during the uh, the creation by pro probably uh, a lot of big tech firms, um, and that's why I think it needs to be amended. All right, great, thank you. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce our fifth speaker, Iana Kaziva. Ms. Kaziva is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Innovation and Digitalization in Law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Vienna. She studied international commercial and tax law in Moscow and holds a candidate of sciences degree in international financial law. Furthermore, she has an LLM degree from the University of Vienna and completed a US intellectual property law certificate program at Stanford University. Before joining the University of Vienna, she worked at the legal department of a California-based media technology company. She's also joining us on Zoom today. Do you wanna make a small introductory statement? Thank you very much for the introduction and for the uh, invitation to speak at this panel. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm a, a, a scholar conducting uh, a research, a, 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 a academic legal research on the regulation of uh, AI. Uh, so, what, so whether AI should be regulated and how it should be regulated in particular in the EU and the United States. Uh, so, and I have some slides that I would like to show and I would like to ask how is it better to uh, to proceed, whether I should share my screen. So, uh, since we are going to, uh, since this panel about the regulation of AI, uh, and in particular we are going to talk about the AI Act, I thought that I would share um, with you some general thoughts about the uh, the uh, the, recent, the, the most recent available version of the AI Act, and in particular, I wanted to focus on two uh, on two issues that I find rather important and very uh, interesting to mention. Uh, so the first one is the definition of AI, of AI system itself. Uh, so how AI is defined in the AI Act, and some exceptions from the uh, from the application of the regulation. So this is the first. So uh, the uh, definition that you see here on this uh, on this slide is the first definition that was proposed uh, by the Commission in 2021. So that's the uh, the, the initial Commission pro uh, proposal. So you see. Uh, so as of course uh, I'm sure that you know. Um, so this definition relied on uh, NX1. So uh, so AI system that is a software that is developed with one or more techniques and the approaches that were listed in uh, NX1. So and uh, NX1 uh, was um, uh, so it mentioned uh, three categories of techniques or uh, 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 approaches that you see here on this slide. So but uh, from the from all the uh, versions of the AI app that followed, so the, uh, this NX1 uh, was deleted. So the EU shifted from this approach to defining artificial intelligence system. Uh, and what uh, we see next, uh, so, uh, this, the, so this is the definition on this slide, you see the definition that is provided by the OECD, so the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, so this definition was first uh, introduced by the OECD in 2019 in the uh, recommendation for AI. And in November 2023, so several months ago, uh, uh, the organization urgently updated the definition of AI system. So, uh, 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 so, uh
So they were so they uh, so their our organization had to prepare a report on the um, uh, um, uh, which was um, a requirement which was mentioned in one of the provisions of the recommendation. Uh, but instead, they decided to postpone that that task, and they decided to urgently update the definition of AI system. And the reason for that was because. Uh, because of the, uh, the ongoing, uh, about the urgent legislative pro processes that were going on in the EU and in Japan. So, in particular, uh, the uh, discussion that was going on the AI Act. So, you see this definition of uh, AI. So, a uh, machine based system that works with purpose of objectives and first from the input it receives how to generate out, uh, outputs. Um, so, such as predictions, content, recommendations, or decisions that can influence physical or virtual environments. And AI systems vary in their levels of autonomy and adaptiveness after deployment. Uh, interestingly, this uh, definition of the OECD is very sim similar uh, to the definition that was, uh, that was introduced in the United States by the executive order. Uh, by, pre by President Biden uh, in uh, October 2023. And finally, in the definition that, uh, of AI system that we see in the, in the most recent very available version of the AI Act, we see the same definition. Uh, so that is practically almost wo uh, word by word uh, the same as the definition that is provided by the OECD and uh, that is uh, also adopted in the United States. Uh, so that is just a very, uh, very interesting observation that the definition uh, that the EU stepped back from the uh, from defining an AI system via the mention of the techniques and the approaches in the uh, annex. So now the annex is in the uh, AI Act starts from from uh, annex two, uh, and uh, so as I just mentioned, the uh, EU followed the following approaches when um, uh, amending the definition of AI system. So the first one is to align the definition of AI uh, system with the definition provided by international organizations, in particular the OECD. Uh, so, so this, uh, on the one hand, uh, this is a very, uh, this is an approach that 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 has a very good point and a very good basis. Uh, so, because AI is cross jurisdictional and cross border, there is cross border application of AI. Uh, so, it would be good to have uh, a common definition of AI, uh, 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 because then it would it would just be easier to regulate this. But I would just like to point some. Um, some concerns that there are, uh, in my view. So first of all, is that I, I believe that there is some political context behind this decision. So if we say that the definition of AI should be um, should be the, the same um, uh, should, uh, because of the cross jurisdictional application of AI. Then, in my view, uh, such leaders in the development of AI as China sh should also participate in the discussion and the, and the elaboration of the definition. Uh, there are also, um, I, I think that it, that it is not a good idea in general to uh, follow the definitions that are adopted in the United States just because of the uh, different legal systems in the EU and in the United States. Uh, so uh, the United States is a common law system. In the EU, most of the states are civil law systems. So in the EU, there is a larger need for a statutory definition of AI, uh, which, which is reliable. And I believe that uh, in the end, what we will see is, as in the other area, uh, areas of law, we will just see the shifting of the burden of defining what, what is an AI system and what is not to the CJU. So the CJU will again do the dirty work as in other uh, areas of law. 
So, in to, uh, so there's Just because we're so pressed on time, could I ask you to uh, finish your introductory remarks within like one or two minutes? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so another int intention was to um, uh, exclude the traditional so software systems. And I can think that uh, that this goal was not uh, achieved by, uh, by the EU because the definition of AI is still over I I inclusive and uh, precise. So, in just a few words on the application I I I exceptions, so one of the well, one of the most important, I believe, is a, a is a Annex Nine, which lists the uh, large scale IT systems. Um, uh, uh, with regard to the uh, 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 to the asylum and migration, so the first version said that the regulation would not apply. Now we have the version that the regulation will apply by 2030, but still there's a lot of um, a lot of um, um, uh, uh, there are a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of questions with particular to. Uh, Article 83, which says that um, that the requirements of the of the regulation will be just taken into a, a account when a, when replacing or amending some laws in these areas. So, and the military and defense purposes and the national security. So, as mentioned, so this, so this is of a great. Concern in uh, in uh, uh, in my view, and it's also not clear what to do with uh, dual use AI systems. So the systems that can be used for both civilian and military purposes. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. So I think we should now move on to the discussion portion of the panel. So. All of you already mentioned the AI Act and why it's necessary, um, but I think it could be beneficial to look once again, what are the concrete benefits of the AI Act? What are its shortcomings? I know a lot of you also mentioned that it doesn't touch upon military use of AI. Um, but another question that I would have, um, obviously the AI Act regulates, but that also means that it restricts the usage of AI. Do you think that the restrictions placed on AI in the AI Act could stifle innovation in the EU, or how can we possibly give companies an incentive to stay in the in Europe and in the EU to develop their AI systems? Who would like to start? Yes. Uh, out of my experience, regulation never stifles innovation. Regulation, as I said, kicks in when innovation is already spreading exponentially. And innovation doesn't come usually from companies. You got an inno in innovation, you've got a disruptive innovative idea, and then you create a company. And it's not regulation that stifles innovation, it's mainly institutions. Uh, and I don't think that this kind of regulation will stifle innovation. Of course, it regulates not the innovation, it regulates the commercialization uh, of a new technology. And of course, it sets certain, through, certain rules that we do not want to cross and go beyond for the safety of our society. Regulations have the aim and the purpose always to create a safe and secure society. And of course, also to push and enforce certain ethics. So I don't believe that any regulation, whenever you hear it, can in, in the end stifle innovation. What stifles innovation in Europe, and that's very negative about ourselves, is our own mindset, because we're not innovative anymore. And uh, I think that's the major problem. We're always lamenting about any regulation, but the main problem in Europe and even here in Austria is, well, get out, have a good new idea, and then you will see that it, it can fly. When I was in the US, was a funny discussion with a colleague of uh, the European delegation with some Americans uh, from uh, some ministry or whatever. Uh, and he was Austrian, and he said, well, this might be a problem. And then the American colleague went, well, you're Austrian, stop it. We're thinking optimistic here. We can solve it, we can do it. And whenever you come up, there's always a problem. And I think this is also the major problem when we talk about stifling innovation. Thank you. Just maybe a quick follow-up question. Do you not think that the non-compliance rules could give um, AI development companies the incentive to stay away just because of the, the danger? 
well, then we should look for something else and be innovative how we can do that. Of course, uh, personally, as a lawyer, uh, I'm fascinated and also as a diplomat because we're still very analog when it comes to regulation. So regulation is still done in words uh, and not by code in, uh, in, in, in many aspects. And we have to rethink if there's another incentive system, for example, uh, that we could use also uh, digitally that has the same impact. My still we have a speed limit of 130. And we're paying a lot of money to that people comply with it. It would be so easy that we have cars that can't go beyond 130. Uh, there are incidents out on the streets, on the highways, because people don't keep the distance. We're paying a lot of money for that. And it would be so easy to have uh, that built in already in two cars that you cars automatically keep the legal uh, distance. So I think there are many ways, and we should be more innovative, of course, also, what smart regulation actually could mean. Thank you. Um, I would agree here that uh, regulation is actually creating new market opportunities, because I'm already receiving cold emails from companies that are branding themselves as um, ensuring uh, ethical compliance with regulation and helping you know, consultants that are um, helping companies com be compliant and of course because it's uh, such a gray area still a lot of companies don't know what the repercussions are going to be uh, for them with this upcoming regulation how exactly they're going to be complying so there's a lot of innovation coming from the ethical AI and responsible AI space uh, that the UAI Act and other regulation is creating as a market need and I see this as a a uh, positive thing. Uh, we can kind of steer innovation towards the areas that are important to us, uh, such as responsible AI and away from irresponsible AI. Yeah, I, I can only add one thing. Um, so I think that argument um, is not valid because it was the same when GDPR was being passed, right? So they always said, yeah, we can't innovate or we can't go to the European market anymore and I don't think any of these companies stayed away from the European market so far. Does any of the online participants want to say something on this? Yeah, okay. I'm also somewhat skeptical about the argument that the regulation is stifling innovation. I mean, we have currently we have the UAI Act, uh, which will come into force 2026, uh, it looks like. We have the executive order of US, and we have also the um, you know, regulation in China. So those three are the ones that come that everyone else would just copy-paste things. And I think, uh, you know, people said that business people, some business people said governments are too stupid to come up with regulation, but that's, that's not true. The uh, EU Act is well thought, uh, the executive order is well thought through, um, Chinese have thought through these things, and uh, I mean, arguably, the uh, executive order is, uh, requires a lot of reporting. It doesn't have um, many teeth. So I think we just have to see how things are going to work out. You know, it's hard to say. We don't really know where things will be going. But you know, like you know, I'm a physics person, so uh, you know, you do some experiments, you run and see, and then see it, what, uh, whether it works or not. So I think what we currently have is um, is pretty good. The uh, problem is actually that what the governance documents are asking for, uh, technology can right now not deliver. You know, there are many, you know, how do you measure this information? How, how do you make, what does it mean to be fair, an algorithm to be fair? The, uh, the thing where uh, you actually can put some good numbers uh, on is something called compute governance. Yeah? Compute is just the computing power. You need computing power. Uh, right now, a lot of computing power for the most powerful language models. And this is something you can actually you know, measure pretty well. You can actually you see it. Uh, you can't hide it. You know, they, they need a lot of energy and a lot of water uh, to, to train these algorithms. Mm, you can also impose, you know, export controls. You don't uh, send out chips. So this is actually uh, the compute governance, which is already happening, is something which, uh, you know, where you can put some numbers around it. It's much more difficult to put numbers around uh, the algorithms and uh, the, uh, you know, maybe the 
uh, the impact or the misuse of applications uh, or put numbers around uh, uh, you know the, the data that have been used to train it or, or put numbers around the talent the people so compute governance is an area where actually we can put around numbers but in general you know, I think we, we have something or there is something and let's just see what it uh, what it gives yeah all right, thank you. Ms. Kaziva, do you also want to say something? Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I would actually not be so sure that the regulation, um, that regulation is always good for, uh, in, for uh, innovation or that it is not an obstacle for in innovation. I think it's, a, a first, so first I believe it uh, very much depends on the kind of regulation. So if we take, for example, the, uh, the data mining, exception that was uh, introduced in the DSM directive so for research. So yes, that uh, regulation provided some legal certainty at least for the research organizations um, as compared to the United States, for example. But um, so the AI Act, for example, it introduces very uh, a lot of requirements uh, in particular for the high-risk AI systems and uh, still, uh, so, so they of course have to comply with the, with the uh, uh, data protection uh, regulation in the EU. And at the same time, for example, if we look at the, the sandboxes, the AI regulatory sandboxes, uh, so and if we compare how the, sandbox, how the sandboxes are operating in different uh, countries, so in the EU, how it's going to work and how it works in countries for example, where the data protections and, pri and privacy rules are not as strict. So I don't know, and I think it's very it's very interesting to see uh, how, um, so where we will end up. Um, so there are uh, other countries, so so if you can take, for example, China or, or uh, other states that, that have the sandboxes, and they are not restricted that much by the data by the protection rules. Or you can take Russia, so in Moscow there's a, a regulatory AI sandbox that, that uh, operates right now, so it's, uh, it was introduced a couple of years ago and it will finish in uh, uh, 2025. So when they are not uh, that much restricted by the data protection rules, so, and I, don't, uh, and I, I cannot answer the question how how it will, um, um, so what the or what the impact will be. All right. Um, two of you mentioned the United States, so maybe a small little side question. Um, do you think that it's possible to effectively regulate AI in the United States, not just using executive orders, but in a partisan agreement, in a partisan uh, environment? as there are many efforts at the moment to regulate in the United States, but as we all know, it's, uh, it's difficult if um, these are often blocked by uh, Republicans. Shall I start? Well, as we heard already today, there are two different legal systems in the United States and here in Europe. And I think that might be quite difficult because there's a completely different approach in the United States when it also comes to liability uh, and introducing new technology. And uh, there is, of course, we have to find an international agreement on that. And we heard already about OECD, uh, this discussion we had uh, seven years already with the White House. Uh, which standards we should apply, and the White House and the U.S. agreed, uh, and they pushed very much that we go with uh, or inside the OECD to have international uh, rules concerning concerning artificial intelligence. But I don't think, uh, and with AI, I'm not a big fan of predictions. All experts have been wrong usually with predictions. Uh, I also have to admit, I fear that the weather forecasts get worse and worse with the climate change, and the models don't work anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and I'm quite frustrated with that. Uh, but it's something else. Thank you. Does anybody else want to comment on the US? Otherwise, I would move on to the next question. All right. So now coming back to the topic of the ethics of AI. As many of you said, as AI develops, um, dangers of misuse can increase. And you also touched upon the military uh, usage of AI. 
what would be the most effective ways for us to deal with the danger of misuse? And what are some of you missing in the AI Act? Uh, may I start? Um, I think one particular point is the biomedic identification. Um, and I think at first it was completely forbidden, um, but now it has a lot of exceptions. Um, I think only the remote uh, biomedic identification in real time is forbidden, um, and everything else is in some way possible. And that paths the way for abuse, I think, because um, you make it technically, technically feasible, and in the end, it's going to be abused because that's the yeah probably the um, I don't know the uh, first step to that, right? And I think another problem is that it's not forbidden already. So if you're going to the Olympic Games, for example, it's here in Paris. You should probably expect to be biometrically uh, monitored, I guess. All right, anybody else? Yeah, I would say definitely for biometric identification, there's plenty of companies like Clearview AI. They're clearly, I mean, it's already, you know, they're, they're, it's been for so many years a discussion about their approach to scraping the data of all of us and using it in order to provide our data to uh, law enforcement and to other agencies uh, in order to facilitate the identification of users. It has been problematized. Some countries have tried to sue them and to prohibit the use of their citizens' data like France. But you know they're still out there. They're still financed with so much money. Um, their, their systems are currently being used in the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict as well. Um, so it's very problematic, and the fact that you know we're always leaving these doors open for such systems um, makes it you know uh, easy for companies to circumvent uh, any type of regulation that always uh, leaves a back door. Um, same you know as we mentioned already for military AI, uh, you know there's so many applications that. Um, in, in the AI Act, it says um, that for civilian uh, purposes and for civilian populations, they would be prohibited, but for military cases, they would be allowed. So if one company already has developed that software and is providing it in so-called military um, uh, situations, uh, you know, currently, for example, in, in Palestine, they have been living under military rule for uh, so many years. So you can argument that you know, in any country for uh, 50 years plus, it's still a military situation and you can uh, still be allowed to use any type of military AI. Uh, so you can have all types of arguments uh, if that system is already out there uh, to be able to use it on, uh, in both military and civilian situations, which is uh, um, um, impermissible in my view. Anyone from online want to contribute to this question? Yeah. I think the, uh, the question on whether to open source a uh, large language model is a crucial one and a difficult one. Mm. You know, my my long-term view about technology is just yeah, is technology is becoming too powerful for people to manage, and uh, it's getting easier and easier to do major damage. Whether it's maybe perhaps in the future uh, in the area of AI or synthetic biology, so you know someone. If you put out tools that are powerful and uh, it gets easier and easier to do damage, someone for sure is going to do damage. So uh, I think uh, on the open sourcing, you know, the, you, you, there are opinions by you know, famous uh, machine learning people like uh, Joshua Bencho or uh, Jeff Hinton. Um, Max Techmark, who are very concerned about open sourcing a large language model. Then on the other side, you have uh, people like Jan de Kuhn from Meta, who says, uh, you yeah, know, who is totally in favor of open sourcing. I, what I've heard from Jan de Kuhn does not convince me. Uh, he said, uh, you can look at the 
YouTube videos uh, where he participated in panel discussions, he says, you know, if things are dangerous, we're just not going to build them. Yeah, but uh, I mean, look at nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are dangerous. We build them. And not only do we build them, we also use them. And uh, so I don't find his, uh, his arguments really convincing. I haven't really heard a convincing argument uh, that just say, okay, open source everything and don't worry, don't worry about it. I don't think that's good. So I think the open sourcing of large language model is going to be uh, a tough one to, to get right. All right, I would have so many more questions, but I think that we should move on to the open questions from the audience, because I'm sure you have questions as well. Sorry, uh, may I just say something? On oh, yeah, of course. Part? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, so since we have a little time, just a small uh, remark that with regards to the question of whether the EU should regulate the AI the, in the military sphere, so if you look at the executive order in the United States, so they do regulate it already. So uh, in particular, there is, uh, they have some requirements for the defense and the, uh, and the, uh, and the military sector. And uh, in particular, in section um, uh, 4.2, they regulate, uh, they have some, re some requirements for dual, for dual use AI. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I think that at least we should look at how, at how it is done and um, uh, because I, I don't think that, that just leaving everything to the international human, uh, humanitarian law or to the national laws of the member states is a good idea. So uh, as it, 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 it is mentioned now in the AIF. All right, great, thank you. Um, so who has questions? Oh wow, a lot. Thank you very much for this very inspiring panel. I have one issue which I'm not sure you addressed. Um, coming from uh, iGlobe News, a news organization, other news organizations, New York Times, Intercept, uh, et cetera, have brought uh, lawsuits against uh, OpenAI and other AI developers, uh, which are all big tech related, because they're using um, data and information for free and I think that is a huge issue uh, which needs to be addressed, which also regulation so far has not addressed. And the second point I wanted to make is that uh, Google Gemini, for instance, um, is very biased in its algorithm, as are others. Um, and I don't think that has also uh, been sufficiently addressed because uh, the regulation today is the information tomorrow of future generations. What are they going to be using? And how will the creators of content be reimbursed um, for using all their content for free for training all these AI systems? How do you um, um, propose in dealing with that subject? Thank you very much. I think we should gather questions first. So maybe, um, yeah, let's. There's two people who have to ask questions for the discussion system, but. Hello, I wanted to ask, um, or at least I wanted to make the point that often, you know, when it comes to regulation, often only larger companies um, profit from regulation because they are the ones that have the resources to, com um, to comply with regulations. They have the money to fight legal battles. And right now, like the best um, large language models are offered by Meta, Google with Gemini, and Microsoft with OpenAI. And I would argue that basically by increasing regulation for AI, eventually we will end up basically um, stifling innovation when it comes to small and independent developers because they don't have the resources to comply with regulation oftentimes. And they are also the ones like, who don't have money to fight legal battles. But often these small and independent open source developers are the ones who like, often have the best intentions. Because often, like we know, like already, like for example, Meta already struggles to um, keep um, disinformation or like to to uh, at least to restrict disinformation on its own platforms on Facebook and Instagram. Or let's say Microsoft is often um, also has like closely collaborates with autocratic governments. Also could use um, influence the development of open AI in the, to the um, to the detriment of democratic societies. So isn't this like the risk? Right, let's gather two more questions and then. 
My name is Gregory Weeks. Um, I find it very interesting what you said about uh, regulating AI in the military sphere. And having studied military history, one of the terms we use is RMA, Revolution in Military Affairs. And my question uh, is, do you think we're going through a revolution in military affairs right now? Thanks for an interesting discussion. I'm from uh, the electronic uh, stone age, and I uh, worked in the Carter administration. And I uh, worked at the FTC, and I was a counsel to presidential commission. So I was wondering if anybody on the panel really thinks um, that we're going to be able to get our hands around this in time. And give me a percentage if anybody thinks uh, over 50% this, this is possible. Because as I look at other examples, even like environment, which is a much simpler issue to me in, in many ways, we're not doing well uh, at COP. So does anybody really feel that we're going to get our hands around this in time? And if so, how? Thanks very much, and thanks for an interesting discussion. All right, so now we've gathered the first round of questions. And because we don't have so much time, and I'd like other people to also be able to ask questions, I'd ask the panelists to each keep their answers very brief, <laughs> even though it's difficult with all these big questions. Great. OK, maybe I can start just quickly trying to address some of these points. Um, uh, with regards to copyright, I'm actually seeing a lot of practices emerging because now it's not only uh, the data of the general public that is being scraped, but also data from large platforms like Twitter or X, like Reddit, like New York Times and so on. And these actors actually have enough power to force the AI developers to purchase their data. So it's not just, you know, independent designers, it's already you know, large platforms uh, whose interests are being encroached on. So I see now some practices emerging, like uh, Google, I think, just signed a licensing agreement with Reddit for $60 million in order to be able to use the data of all of their users. Other platforms are for sure going to follow that example. Adobe is already reimbursing a lot of their contributors. So uh, now that you know, the big players uh, are also getting involved, I think we're going to reach uh, a status quo where uh, the AI developers are going to see themselves forced to purchase that data and to get uh, licensing agreements for it, uh, which is great, you know, because uh, until now, uh, ever since uh, the age of deep learning started, everyone has just been scraping data from online sources and you know, getting away with uh, using that data for free, but now, you know, we're seeing those uh, practices emerge. Um, with regards to uh, innovation, I actually think that uh, this was the, and, and coming, you know, from smaller uh, players and with, uh, um, as opposed to large companies, I think this was the idea of the sandboxes, right? Nobody still knows how these are gonna work, but, you know, that was the general idea that these independent, smaller players would be able to work within these sandboxes. Um, but of course, yeah, but it's, it's still unclear uh, how these are going to be set up. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about the uh, revolutionary um, military uh, affairs. What, what was the... Revolution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I actually wouldn't be able to say that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm currently really looking into and, and trying to wrap my mind around in terms of yeah, AI's impact on, on, military, uh, on the military industry. Um, I would say definitely we have at our disposal much uh, more dangerous technology like nuclear weapons and we have reached a situation in which uh, there's just a stalemate and nobody's attempting to use uh, nuclear technology yet, uh, at least for now, uh, since the drop of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. But, um, I really hope that uh, at some point companies are going to reach a, a similar level where they just say, okay, nobody's going to be using AI at you know, that level because it's going to get dangerous for all of us uh, in that case. Okay, sorry uh, for taking such a long time. Uh, very quickly, I don't believe we don't get it right, but I hope I might be wrong with my prediction as usual. Uh, as you said, with uh, climate change and the environment, we, we messed it all up. So it will be very difficult, but it's an issue that we still discuss about the control of new technologies, that we give those innovations a clear guardrail, which we missed out, for example, with the internet. And that's the problem we still have to work on when it comes to data. And when I have one point negative in uh, the AI Act is data governance, it's horrible. Because as I, as a lawyer, would say, 
this is unconstitutional how generic the formulation about data governance is uh, in, in the AI Act. It's not clear. Uh, Matt, just come, I fully agree with you, it's a huge problem for small companies, but not only in, in technology in general. And the reason is bad lawmakers and a culture of control. Uh, people don't, uh, lawmakers try to control everything now with, with regulation. And they don't clearly set certain rules, and if you act against them, then there will be uh, clear sanctions. Uh, and there's an immense culture of control also in, in Europe to put everything into the law that it's something doesn't happen. I, I fully agree with that, and that's a huge problem. But innovation is also stifled by Amazon, because usually those startups who are really innovative are bought up by them, and then disappear, or, well, something else happens with them. I change hat now to my official hat. 29th, 30th of April will be a huge conference on autonomous weapon systems here in Vienna, exactly to discuss what to do under the title uh, Human Mankind at the Crossroads. All right, now one more round of questions. Who has questions? Copyright in the. Uh, yeah, sure. With respect to copyright, what I would be interested in, and perhaps uh, the law colleague on the panel or in the audience could tell us, I would like to know how long would it actually take, for example, for the New York Times lawsuit to, uh, to go through. I mean, if this takes years, then I think uh, tech will, high, big tech will just have steamrolled everything. And uh, with respect to the uh, question from the uh, gentleman of the electronic scene, uh, Stone Age, there was a... Uh, Paper, I forget now where it is published, I'm not sure whether it's archived or org or whether it was actually in uh, maybe PNS or some such magazine, um, where people, you know, experts were asked about, uh, you know, sort of along the lines whether they think uh, we will get it right, the, the governance of AI. And uh, I think a lot of people have advanced the timeline when they think that really powerful artificial general intelligence will come. And uh, if I remember correctly, I think the number was that maybe one out of five thinks that AI will eventually uh, just you know, annihilate uh, humankind. So, okay, you have to, I don't know what, what these numbers are worth, because you know it's also known that experts are not much better at forecasting uh, the future than uh, the person on the street. So, but it's, you know, it's kind of amazing that if you know, one out of five people think that AI is going to be uh, at the end of humankind, uh, well, they still work on it. So, yeah, pretty, uh, pretty dismal outlook. I think it, you know, whenever you run experiments, you cannot get it right the first time. And the AI might, might just be too powerful, and if we don't get it right, it could be really, really bad. All right, now two more questions. Two people definitely have to ask I questions. Also some questions. Yes, sure. I'm sorry I'm pressing you guys so much, but we're a little bit pressed for time. But yes, sure. Thank you. I will, I will just say a couple of sentences. So regarding copyright uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, so some argue that copyright is not really even a question because such use of training data for uh, of data for training AI models is a fair use so i i do not personally think that it is a fair use and if there are to be exceptions i think that as in the eu it should be only for the research of the or for the cultural heritage organizations as we have in the uh, in the eu and regarding the question i believe um so regarding that google germany is very biased uh, so i think that the right framework for this, the legal framework for this question would be the, uh, not, probably not the AI Act, but the, but the Digital Services Act, and, the, and maybe the Digital Mar uh, Markets Act, but in particular the Services Act, uh, because, so it would address the question of uh, uh, disinformation. Uh, uh, so if that is the question. All right, now two more questions. I think we should start with the two people who are signed up as discussants. So maybe we start here with Mariam. Hi, my name is Mariam Cindy. I'm a student at the DA and also editor-in-chief at the student-run magazine, Polemics, here at the DA. Um, a challenge we've, uh, we've been coming across is students wanting to use AI-generated images to display their articles. and. A lot of these images are marketed as copyright free, 
but obviously we've been hesitant to allow it because it's a legal and ethical gray area, but is there a way legally to use and publish AI-generated images? All right, and now uh, I would say two more questions. We have to ask Anna next, because she's also a discussant. And after this, two more questions, and then you'll have to continue your discussions later on. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question also relates to the use of AI in the media. And we heard a bit about the benefits of the use of AI in the medical field, for example. Um, but I'm curious what the panelists think about the general use of AI in the media, how it affects journalists, and if they see any future opportunities for integrating AI into journalistic fields without putting journalists' jobs at risk, and how we would go about regulating that. All right, so two more questions. Hi, I'm Sean, and I'm a first-year MISE student here at the Academy. And my question was, in regards to military use of AI, considering it isn't visually obvious in the same way that, say, using, like, uh, fire in military is illegal. Um, what what purpose would such restrictions serve beyond like finger waving at countries down the line when you found that they did use them? And wouldn't it be better to actually focus on utilizing AI for defensive military measures, uh, seeing as it's probably going to inevitably get used for offensive measures down the line? Sorry if that's pessimistic, but, you know. All right, one more question. Thank you very much. Just there's, next door, there's the Technical University of Vienna, from where there's a, a big initiative, worldwide initiative, called Digital Humanism. And one of the proponents is a great Israeli scientist, Moshe Vardi, who said uh, all the ethical stuff is like uh, children playing with toys. Um, the question is, who has the power? And apparently, the powerful are the, are the tech companies, the big tech companies. So don't you think that instead of uh, trying to regulate all kind of aspects, we should talk about regulating or disbanding the big tech companies? Thank you. All right, so I think we can take five minutes to uh, wrap up everything. So whoever wants to start. OK, I'm going to start again. Um, so uh, with regards to using AI-generated uh, images, actually a lot of the generators right now offer their users uh, the ability to indemnify them in case they get sued for using copyrighted data. So just you know, look at their terms and conditions. I'm pretty sure that Adobe systems and also maybe Google systems, uh, if any of their users ends up in trouble, they are actually offering to indemnify you and to cover your expenses which is great. Um, so yeah, I don't think that you need to be worried there. And that's also you know, this new practice that's just emerging because a lot of uh, users have that concern. Uh, with regards to yeah, defense versus offense purposes, I would say defense in, military, uh, in the military industry is always an oxymoron for me. Um, you know, everyone who says that they're in the uh, Department of Defense and so on, uh, most likely, they're also working on offensive uh, technologies, and, and you know, it's, it, it doesn't uh, make sense to make that distinction uh, for me personally. Um, but I mean, you're right. Uh, very frequently, these uh, you know weapons are already lethal, and the fact that we're using AI to augment them doesn't. I mean, maybe it wouldn't matter whether we use AI or not. But it's also a matter of uh, you know use, giving AI access to all of these killer robots and you know the, the harmful technologies that uh, start to have uh, less and less human oversight on top of them. You know these are technologies that are already being used to make decisions about uh, what areas should be bombed and what targets should be um, bombed, for example. And you know humans are supposed to review these targets, but you know frequently we call this automation bias. You know the human just says, okay, you know the system says that this is fine. Let's just go ahead and bomb this, and that happens at a massive scale. Um, so I think it's also a matter of you know the reduction of human agency on uh, all of these decisions with regards to mm, destructions uh, in mass. And then with regards to your question in particular about regulating and seizing you know, the five big tech players that are responsible for most of these new innovations and for going fast and breaking things. I think that ties to the gentleman's question about like, how do we even wrap our uh, head, uh, hands around uh, AI. 
I would say yes, definitely. There are five to ten companies currently that are leading that, uh, you know, that innovation and uh, setting these precedents. If they are controlled and regulated, I would say you know everyone else follows suit. So that's yeah. All right. Anybody else want to add something? Maybe I can add something to the question of uh, AI in media because I think it's a twofold thing because um, on the one hand it's going to be easier to write articles, use images, etc. Right, um, but on the other hand it promotes misinformation a lot, um, manipulated content, etc. And one thing uh, the AI Act is saying, yeah, you need to make it transparent to everybody that the content is generated uh, generated by an artificial intelligence. But I think uh, that's not enough because um, one thing we need to strengthen here is media competence in general. Like um, teach people how to use different uh, sources um, and to sort the information, classify the information and uh, see um, and not believe everything you see and read for like one uh, simple information right now. All right, great. So I think we could go on and on because this topic is such a, a new and developing issue. So thank you so much to our excellent speakers. I definitely learned a lot, and I'm thinking that all of you did as well. So maybe a round of applause for our speakers. All right. Thank you, everybody.